My name is Anthony Salas, and I'm the Event and Membership Manager with Welcoming America. And again, welcome to our webinar today brought to us by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs entitled Metro Chicago Lessons of Inclusion from the Windy City. And uh, as many of you know, if you're members of our Welcoming Network here, we do provide you with a number of resources. Uh, and these webinars are just one small example of those types of resources that we offer you. Um, we invite you to go to the member only section of our site and look at those resources, not only again the webinars, but toolkits, uh, white papers, uh, anything that's on there is available to you to download. So you can go to welcomingamerica.org forward slash learn forward slash resources and see all of that. Um, our presentation today, at any point, we do invite you to use that chat feature that you're using right now and enter in your questions for our uh, panelists that will be joining us shortly. And uh, we're going to try and get to some of those as the presentation goes on. But if we don't, uh, we will have some dedicated time at the end of the presentation where we'll just really dive into a, a good Q&A there. So again, keep those coming in as the presentation goes on. And with that, it is now my pleasure to turn things over to our moderator. Joining us today is Juliana Kerr. She is the Senior Program Director of Migration for the Walder Foundation. And Juliana is going to take things from here and introduce you to our panelists. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you everyone for tuning in today. It's a pleasure to be here and to facilitate this conversation. Um, I work now at the Walder Foundation. It's a family foundation based in Skokie, just outside of the city of Chicago. We began our grant making in 2018 and among our five program areas is migration and immigrant communities. This is a program area that aims to make Chicago an exemplary welcoming city for immigrants and a global leader on migration. The Walder Foundation was pleased to provide support to both the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for the new report that was just released in September, a global welcome Metro Chicago's approach to immigrant inclusion and support to Welcoming America for their work. Um, these past few years, I don't, I don't need to tell anyone on this call, um, have certainly illuminated the role cities can play in responding and adapting to the realities of immigration in our country. And while cities may not have much control over the national policies, they are very much on the front lines of ensuring successful integration, shaping narratives, and building social cohesion. They are increasingly demonstrating innovative leadership and sharing best practices and we believe their collective action could be a key to influencing national and global policies of inclusion as well. So today we have this great conversation, a great panel lined up uh, for our conversation. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Rachel Parrish, the Executive Director of Welcome America and our host. Thank you, Rachel, for bringing your team together on this. Rob Perrell, a demographer in Chicago, fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and co-author along with Paul McDaniel, of the report that I mentioned, and Nubia Willman, Director of the City of Chicago's Office of New Americans. We have about an hour to go through a range of different topics that we'd like to cover, and I will be looking at the chat room, trying to integrate the questions that you have as well into the discussion. So let's get started. I'd like to start first with Rachel. Um, you know, Welcome America has been around for about 10 years now, and I suspect that most of the viewers are very familiar with the network. Uh, and are tuning in, you know, just um, really engaged in the work that you're doing and advancing the goals. Um, but for those who are not familiar with the growth and the impact of Welcoming America, uh, I'd like for you to just kick us off and share some of those key strategies, um, particularly how it's changed and evolved over the past few years as well. Mm. Well, thank you, uh, Juliana, for uh, for your introductions and just, you know, big thanks again to you and to the Walder Foundation for, for supporting this work, for being champions of this work. Also uh, wanna thank uh, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs uh, and, and Rob and Paul McDaniel in particular uh, for their excellent report and really capturing so much of the amazing work that has been happening in Chicago. Uh, and then of course, uh, to the mayor's office and to you Nubia, just for your tremendous leadership, especially in this in this moment, and I think if there's one thing uh, that I can can share with all of you, it is that sense of of hopefulness that is really exemplified in Chicago and in so many of Welcoming America's 
members as being really positive role models for what an inclusive society can be and the potential of an inclusive society. And for me, the experience of going through COVID and seeing so many communities really uh, rise to the occasion and, and really um, refuse to let neighbors die because of their race, because of their status, because of their zip code shows what we can be on the best of, of days. And I think that that spirit uh, is something that exists throughout our 200 members in the United States, uh, our six global partners, uh, and is what we uh, exist to serve and support and really amplify every day at Welcoming America uh, through our work. And uh, really to uh, you know, help leaders with the practical tools that they need to, to, to live out that vision of an inclusive community uh, and feel supported through a network of peers uh, who, are, who are doing that work in other places. And I think what we've seen in the last decade, uh, and you know, with a, with a special shout out again here to Chicago in recognizing its leadership role in, in helping us get, uh, in particular, um, our network of municipalities off the ground, but also, you know, the many advocates that, uh, you know, stood before that work uh, and really fueled it, going back, you know, way before Welcoming America was Welcoming America. Uh, to really um, be a kind of uh, ignition <laughs> uh, in fueling so many others uh, that have since come on board uh, in recent years. And, and really the, the purpose of us operating as a collective uh, is to make the work that Chicago is doing and that so many places are doing a norm, uh, not just in America, but, but worldwide. Uh, and when I think about um, what it looks like for communities to just have as practice the kind of welcoming infrastructure that Chicago has put in place, uh, and I know we'll, con we'll continue building, um, it's really about seeing that our diversity isn't just a fact, uh, but, but an asset that we, that we work every day to make sure uh, we're, we're deliberately weaving into the fabric of community so that every single member of of a community inclusive of immigrants sees that their voice uh, matters, uh, that they're able to shape decisions uh, and, and really able to shape the future of their community. Uh, and that is just business as usual. Um, so we look forward to continuing to turn that value into practice and, and really to today's conversation. Thank you, Rachel. Rob, let's get you um, let's get you to present some of those key demographic trends uh, that were highlighted in the report. I think that that'll really help us orient some of this conversation, um, both around welcoming cities broadly, but also the specific lens on Chicago. Uh, if you'd like to kick us off with some of the the maps, I know that you have. Thank you. Okay. Okay. We, we thought we would start with just a quick uh, geography lesson or overview from an airplane, so to speak. And um, I think that you'll see a, a map of Chicago here. And I, I think that you'll be able to see the kind of gray outline of the city. Uh, but I wanted to uh, then use that to point out some interesting things about uh, this place we live in. Uh, Eight million people in the metropolitan area. And um, when you, uh, this map basically showing, you know, sections getting darker and that means the percent of uh, the area that's made up of immigrants is as high as 70 percent or at least uh, 38 percent in those darkest areas and um, just wanted to show you something real quickly so here uh, we're in downtown chicago uh, over here but uh, we have this long history in chicago of uh, immigrant groups uh, setting up in the city and moving out in a trajectory like this northwest outside of the city of chicago and the same thing happens in the southwest trajectory of the city of Chicago. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm doing this is to say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, this, this movement of immigrants to Chicago is, is really uh, going on for a long time now, uh, way back into the middle of the 19th century. And that has a role in the a welcoming attitude that exists here. Uh, there's a long history of uh, recent immigration but uh, the other thing this uh, map is showing you is that uh, the intensity of some of the immigration, that we have really not just a few, but many uh, in large geographic swaths of the region that are, uh, are highly foreign born. And uh, when you add in uh, the children of immigrants, you know, you're looking at many areas, 30% uh, uh, plus uh, to 50% first and second generation. And then the last thing that I think this map maybe gives an indication of is 
Well, where look at look at where those uh, darkest areas with the high immigrant concentrations. Look at where they're at right now in history. If we were looking at this a hundred years ago, everything would be in a small nucleus in Chicago. But immigration here, and also in the cities where practically all of you are joining from, immigration is a suburban phenomenon more and more. Right? It's not just people coming to central city neighborhoods, which is the conversation we had uh, 30, 40 years ago. And uh, for, for immigrant integration, my last comment on this map, my immigrant integration, uh, the fact of this dispersion of immigrants over an entire region, uh, it, it kind of collides with the fact that we don't have metropolitan government. So policies and practices to integrate immigrants and to uh, react to uh, things related to immigration uh, it's very uh, atomized and broken up across a lot of different actors. And I think we'll talk about that later on some more, but you, you see that uh, in this map, for example, uh, of this 8 million person region, and now I'm gonna start going to my numbers. We can maybe get off the map if you want. Um, in this uh, 8 million person region, uh, uh, we've got 1.6 million uh, immigrants uh, in the region. It's a, it's a large population. It's one out of uh, every five people here. Um, so that's, that's the sort of the overall numbers at 1.6 million. But the other things that are important now, talking about data and statistics of who the immigrants are on, a couple, on a, just a couple more topics, is um, the diversity of those immigrants. Uh, so that uh, about a third of the immigrants are from Mexico. It is the preponderant group here, but then almost another 10% are from India and almost another 10% are from uh, Poland. I, I highlight those top groups because it shows that the immigration comes from a lot of different places, really different parts of the globe. Um, and after, after you look at uh, Mexico, India, Poland, uh, there's what, what we call a long tail of countries that are present in really large numbers of at least 10,000 people. This probably plays a role in immigrant integration and that immigrant uh, communities here have not just been seen as monolithic or uh, of one race or of one group that uh, anyone feels any kind of contact uh, connection with. Uh, so that diversity is important to note. Um, and um, yeah, I think I could go on more about uh, the statistics, but I think those are the important things. It's the size and the scope and the dispersion across the region. And then, we get to the, then we'll get to the topic today of, well, given all of that, how have we been able to create the policies in Chicago and statewide, which I, I assume will tick off at some point in this report uh, or in this conversation, Juliana, you can tell me if not. Um, you know, if we, if we listed out the policies that have been passed by the city and policy by the state, they're really worth, um, uh, worth listing out to some extent because we, we have had a, a, a good experience here with uh, creation of immigrant friendly policies. Yeah, no, thank you, Rob. And, um, and the report uh, does a great job of kind of spelling out where the city of Chicago has jurisdiction and what they're able to do at the local level versus what's at state level, what's at national level, even what Cook County has been able to do. So it really kind of spells out these different levels of governance um, and who, who can you know, advance what policies. I think that that's actually a great segue to bring over into Nubia um, to share out in the city of Chicago. So that map, you know, I think mm -hmm. it's really illuminating uh, to think when two thirds of the Metro of Chicago's immigrant population lives in suburban areas. Um, but the city of Chicago is a leader, um, both in, in voice and in practice. And if you could just share through your big mandate, um, <laughs> running the, the Office of New Americans, um, the responsibilities, and also, you know, what I think is super interesting is the stated goals of the office and what was kind of mm -hmm. the original plan when mm -hmm. it was created versus a lot of the rapid response work you've been doing this past mm -hmm. year when it comes to national policies that are announced overnight or mm -hmm. you know, responding to COVID, which I know mm -hmm. has been um, kind of a, a very much unpredictable uh, <laughs> scenario for, for your office. So please share, yeah. um, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, to say the least, yeah, COVID, we'll get there. Well, hello, everyone, Nubia Wilman, and I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for tuning in and wanting to learn more about Chicago and the metro area and the immigration work we've been able to do. Um, Julian, I think in terms of what the stated goals were, I have them very clear in my mind because I entered this role a little bit over a year ago with this like pie in the sky idea of, you know, how we could make Chicago even better, even more welcoming. 
Um, and then, of course, lots of things have happened. But let me tell everyone kind of the level set of what the role of Office of New Americans is really about. So we're really focused on about three bucket areas. The first being economic development of immigrants and refugees. This includes really cultivating, especially those small businesses. We have very many um, immigrants who own small businesses. When we think of Chinatown and Little Village, quite a few of those um, businesses were either started by immigrants or continue to be maintained by immigrants. We also look at education as a form of economic development to making sure folks are integrated into the education system, both primary and higher ed, um, so that folks can continue to gain some economic trajectory in their life. We also then look at um, community well-being, and frankly, this is really where we talk about that protection against federal uh, policies and enforcement. And this is really kind of where it, the meat of our work, right, because it's a lot of reactive and proactive work to make sure folks are protected, especially in these past recent years when cities with the title welcoming city have been targeted by the federal administration with increased enforcement, increased threats of enforcement, which even by themselves really puts people, um, it upends the communities and the lives because you just don't know what's happening. Um, so there is a lot of work that's related around protection against ICE, protection against the federal government, but economic well-being also means making sure that folks have access to resources. They understand that they're able to obtain resources, especially for folks who are new, who come from countries and communities where systems are different. And we just want to make sure folks understand they're able to participate in these resources as well. And that kind of ties into the civic integration, which is the third bucket of our work, which really, really focuses around language access. So making sure we have information available in the necessary languages. Chicago does have a language access ordinance, but there are so many languages and so many ways to, to, to have to provide that information. But that is a moving target that we're constantly kind of assessing and figuring out better and uh, more effective ways to manage the message. Beyond language access is also just providing information, right? So if we have applications, if we have um, deadlines for programs for MBEs or school situations, how, we're, how are we making sure that all immigrants within the, and refugees within Chicago are um, getting this information so that they can participate? And we really want that civic integration and want them to see the government, the local government, as a partner to them in a place where they can go for information and services. So that was uh, by itself a large uh, amount of work to do, even on normal times, even when the federal government was doing its thing. Uh, it, it took up a lot of our time and resources uh, and it was difficult. And then COVID hit. And so COVID unfortunately, as it did with so many things, really upended most of our work. And while we're still focusing on those three buckets, at the height of COVID, the idea was almost really survival for all three of those areas, making sure that our immigrant businesses survive. When we think again about Chinatown, which is almost ground zero in terms of business impact because of the unfortunate um, ramifications of, of, of the origination, um, we really were thinking, like, how are we going to ensure that Chinatown survives? Because we can't have Chicago without Chinatown. But if those businesses don't survive, especially during shelter in place, like, what are we going to do? And the same in terms of the resources the, uh, with uh, accessing information, that was especially uh, difficult in terms of language access, in terms of getting information out as fast as possible, but still in a way that made sense um, because we didn't want to send someone who, you know, send information out in, in Arabic, for example, but the person who wrote it because we were trying to do it fast, didn't do it correctly. So all of those really minute details to the larger issues really, uh, pushed us to have to act very quickly. And I think also at the same time, while um, ICE enforcement on the ground was limited during the height of COVID, the reality was that those threats were continuing. And even folks who were still detained, folks who still had to go to court, were very literally not just the immigrants who had cases and in, in proceedings, but the advocates, the immigration attorneys who had to go with them. Again, surviving, do they have PPE? Do they know how to like maintain social distancing? All of those things really uh, flipped a little bit of what we needed to focus on. And rather than having these long-term strategies and plans, which can be effective and allows us to be more strategic, we were really working like a, a day was a week, a week was a month, and kind of as fast as possible. 
So now things have sort of leveled out. Of course, there's still a lot of response that has to happen. There's still so many consequences to COVID. But I think the silver lining, which I hate to use that term, but in reality, uh, really was sparked by Mayor Lightfoot's executive order, which she signed around March or April, um, really uh, underscoring that all the resources from the city had to be accessible to folks, regardless of immigration status. And that really comes from our welcoming city ordinance, people who were like, oh, well, we've been doing that forever, which is true. But it really helped us from two folds. The first being that it reminded community members, again, that they had access to these resources that were coming down the pike. And then internally, it allowed all the practitioners to remember, <laughs> you know, that this is actually a mandate. We have to make sure that when we have an application for a business loan fund, that we're not asking just for socials, that we have alternatives, that we're not asking for IDs, that, you know, all of those things. So it created kind of a policy framework. Uh, which we have found helpful in terms of rapid response and we're hoping to use that framework and flesh it out a little bit further so that other departments who are working not necessarily in such emergent situations are able to use that effectively that's great yeah i know that this year has been um quite a quite a ride for for your office and um thank you for all the work you're doing Rachel, um, when we talk about welcoming cities, you know, a lot of times we focus on the governance aspect. We'll, we'll look at what mayors are spearheading, what's coming out of policies. Um, but you have noted many times that a welcoming city is really, it's not just governance. There's a whole range of stakeholders and actors that help build that movement. And you've also observed, you know, not being in Chicago, looking in, um, this kind of unique experience and history that Chicago has that, um, allows it to, to have flourished in its own way. And when you look at other cities that are trying to develop their own frameworks for welcoming agendas and you know, what models are out there, I know you've, you've often talked about Chicago and somewhat of a unique experience. So it, would you mind sharing um, some of your thoughts with the group? Yeah, I would love to. And I, I guess I would say too, I mean, the, the things that I love to, to point out here, both are unique to Chicago, um, but I think are true of, of many places, regardless of whether they're a big city or a small town. And, and maybe this is a good moment too, to just give a shout out to Champaign-Urbana, who's done some amazing work and just recognize that, you know, there, there's a huge opportunity, I think, ahead of us <laughs> for this work to happen in, in other parts of, of Illinois. And they're gonna look different <laughs> than they have in, in Chicago. Um, but one thing that I think will, will be a common bond and I know is true in, in many parts of the country is that yes, this is really about a partnership. And when Chicago first created its plan, it was really the voice of many different leaders in the community coming together to define what a, what a more welcoming and inclusive Chicago would look like. Uh, and we see that all over the country that the importance of those stakeholders uh, whether they are uh, advocacy groups, whether they are arts organizations, uh, the YMCA, which is obviously headquartered in Chicago, has played an important role in many communities uh, and, and, and Ch Champaign-Urbana as well. Uh, and we just put out a report uh, with Art Place America on the intersections between immigration and arts and culture organizations. And I think you know the richness of Chicago's arts and culture community is so powerful. Uh, it's something that I hope will continue to be an important part of the work and really shaping that broader narrative of, of belonging and, and not just the belonging of immigrants, but really the belonging of every single Chicagoan, uh, which brings me to the second thing that I think is both unique and not unique for Chicago, um, which is its migration history. And obviously, you know, there were people indigenous to Chicago who were uh, the original receiving community, uh, many of whom were displaced from their lands. Uh, there um, was a rich history of migration coming out of uh, the Black Americans who, who were escaping the Jim Crow South and who came to Chicago. And many of the existing inequalities uh, that exist in Chicago today are really a legacy of the unwelcome <laughs> that, that happened in that, um, in that period of the Great Migration. Uh, and so I think part of the opportunity that is in front of Chicago and in front of many of our cities is to really look back uh, and, and reckon with that history uh, and think about how uh, efforts uh, that look to address some of the zero-sum narratives that form around demographic change around immigrants uh, and really that spark of demographic change uh, can be an opening to, to really examine more deeply the, the inequality, the racism, the othering of many groups uh, in communities uh, and, and try to find a way through that. And I think Chicago is doing some really interesting work around that. I know 
we'll, we'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, and maybe if I can just point to one other thing uh, in, in the same vein, it's the idea that uh, Chicago really has an imperative as a city that has historically been losing population, uh, not just to attract people, but really to help um, folks put down roots. And, and when I think about what, what we really mean when we say a community is welcoming, it's not the idea that you come and you be, you, you come to a community and you sort of forever live as this outsider or guest. Welcoming is really about uh, coming and, and being a homeowner, being part of creating and shaping that community. Uh, and, and I think uh, the opportunity to bring in so many organizations to wrestle with history and to really look at uh, how we can give voice to, to so many more people is, is what welcoming is uh, and, and can be for, for a city like Chicago. Yeah, the, uh, the report that Rob and Paul authored um, goes through a variety of different stakeholders as well in the Chicago metropolitan area, um, you know, legal advocates, uh, direct service providers, um, shelters, I mean, just so many different advocacy groups and community representatives that uh, we know have been essential in creating um, the, the climate that we have in our region. Um, and the business leadership too. I think when I look at some organizations like the Illinois Business Immigration Coalition, you know, really mobilizing the business leadership in Chicago. Um, Rob, uh, the report also points out a number of the challenges. You know, Chicago has a lot of strengths, and I, I know outside looking in, especially when I talk to some groups in in areas of the country that are maybe um, more restrictive on their policies. You know, they really put Chicago up on. Uh, uh, beacon of, of hope, but, you know, internally looking uh, at our city, we, there's still a lot of work to be done, and the report does outline some of those challenges and opportunities, opportunities for improvement. Uh, do you want to walk through some of those recommendations that are uh, itemized out in the report? Uh, yeah, let me just um, move over here a little bit of my screen. Um, well, one of the things we talk about is um, uh, Chicago and Illinois have created a lot of immigrant policies. And, and again, uh, just to quickly tick them off, and uh, uh, is uh, that in the state of Illinois, uh, undocumented children, and, and as of this year, undocumented seniors get a Medicaid-like health care program. The state of Illinois has long provided driver's licenses to the undocumented and other documentation. Uh, in recent years, um, law enforcement agencies across the state have been prohibited from cooperating with ICE. Well, from holding someone who doesn't have specifically a warrant from ICE uh, uh, by them. And um, you know, the state operates immigrant welcoming centers, six of them, uh, where immigrants can go and get information on uh, things they're eligible for. Uh, the state promotes uh, naturalization through something called New Americans Initiative, and it you know, puts money into it. Um, there's an immigrant family resource program that uh, again, provides funds to community organizations to um, um, help immigrants apply for programs that they're uh, eligible for and get language assistance in doing that. So, you, so you've got this, you've got, got this long history of things. And I think your original question, I want to acknowledge was, was about, uh, you know, challenges to us. Well, so the challenges probably are um, kind of very different kinds of challenges. One is um, this this governance structure we talked about, the fact that the city of Chicago is able to do things for immigrants, partly because it's a big city with some resources and ability to do that. Um, but ironically, as time goes on, Chicago actually begins to occupy a smaller share of all the immigrants who are living here. So how do we get the suburbs and suburban municipalities to start uh, doing uh, their own versions of this? And, and I can tell you that uh, you go back to that map I had up before, if you went to the suburbs that have very large immigrant populations, and even if you merely click on their website, and these are large suburbs sometimes, and look at who's on the school board, the police board, the fire board, the elected officials, look at who's employed in the city, and they do not look like the communities they represent. So the, the, the integration of immigrants into the, um, uh, structures of governance it has just not really happened um, anywhere near the level it should have, even though I could give you examples of suburbs where, yeah, they've done a much better job of that, uh, Skokie, Illinois, to the north of us. So it's a bit of a patchwork, uh, but that does show some of the, the challenges. Um, other challenges, uh, well, a couple of things that obviously, uh, 
how do we focus and maintain focus on immigration given a couple of things? Uh, there's, uh, given the fact of uh, COVID, which is uh, understandably absorbing about 99.9% of our, our collective, uh, you know, uh, civic uh, interest right now. Uh, the challenge also is, uh, given the tragic shutdown of immigration that's going on, uh, of, of refugees being driven down to zero admissions, of, uh, of um, all the temporary high-skilled visas, H-1B visas, et cetera, sand being thrown in the gears of the process by the federal government. Uh, it's true also of the um, applicants for family-based immigration. You know, one, one thing after another. So naturalization becoming more expensive and harder and you're at risk of losing it anyway. Given all of that, a challenge is, um, you, know, you know, fighting that and also that, we were not getting new immigrants. <laughs> so we've, we've built this infrastructure. We are a city and a region that needs immigrants more than most others do because people from here like to move to Texas and California and Florida. Um, we need immigrants badly. We've developed a great infrastructure, just a heck of a, 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 an infrastructure for it. Uh, we're, we're almost targeted with all of this immigrant uh, uh, system uh, uh, attacks going on from Washington. So how do we uh, keep fighting that? And then in the midst of that, or I guess I mentioned this, with, with Chicago becoming a little less of the, the, the nexus of immigration here, um, yeah, how do we, how do we sort out uh, and, 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 and find leadership outside the area, outside the immediate traditional you know, centers of, um, of immigrant residents? Yeah, and these are, you know, when I when I just think about some experiences around the world, you know, Barcelona is coming up with metropolitan agendas and policies that's not just out of the city. Or when you're talking about refugees, you know, Canadian models for community sponsorship uh, programs of re refugee resettlement. So just thinking, you know, where are the possibilities for cities in the United States for our governance to change, uh, to to adapt to some maybe new ways of doing things. Um, Nubia, one of the one of the challenges, and Rachel alluded to it, is uh, in Chicago is a lot of the the history of racial segregation and um, marginalization that we've seen, black and brown communities that have been disproportionately affected by so many of our policies. And in the report, there are some uh, quotes, several quotes, and the authors have alluded to it about this this racial oppression in the black communities and the policy issues uh, that have led to the isolation. And it's separate from some of the immigration community concerns. And so thinking about this racial justice movement and ideas for moving forward where we can speak in unity, uh, what are some of the programs and initiatives underway right now in Chicago that's addressing that? No, yes, absolutely. I think one of Mayor Lightfoot's uh, common refrains, what she has emphasized is our and a North Star is equity and inclusion. And I think we can't do our work without recognizing the history of the city and understanding the trauma that many communities have gone through and figuring out a way to do trauma-informed government services. So that is kind of an overall goal that we all have. When it comes to the immigration work, I have gone to plenty of community meetings where that feeling, and frankly, sometimes even stated of why them, not us, what about me and it's it's a hard um, issue to get through because I, I completely understand given the history of why there is tension why there is anger and concern and fear that there isn't enough resources to go around and so what we have been able to do is to think uh, strategically and proactively about ways to be as inclusive and, and equitable as possible in all of the resources we're putting forward I think the best example for that is the Chicago Resiliency Fund which was ultimately managed by the Resurrection Project. And I cannot uh, elevate them enough. They're a fantastic community-based organization who stepped up in the midst of COVID and said, yes, we will manage this fund. So for overall, the, the fund provides $1,000 cash assistance to folks who were excluded from the federal stimulus. Many other cities structured something similar, but it was very much focused only on immigrants. And while in Chicago, this obviously was also marketed and outreach happened to the immigrant communities, 
other folks who were not included. So that could include college students who were on their who were dependents on their family and living in poverty, returning residents, uh, folks on disability who were excluded from the federal stimulus could also apply for this fund. So that was just um, an easy kind of give for us to say, okay, like we can create this, but instead of saying, you know, we see all these groups who are hurting, but we're only going to give it to this portion because that's my niche or that's, you know, what other folks are doing. We decided not to do that. We became as expansive as possible, which is very different than other cities. Of course, it was more complicated. And of course, you know, we created different types of outreach issues. But again, uh, TRP really rose to the occasion and was able to really um, keep that going. And I do have to highlight again, it launched at 5 million around June. And they've been doing, um, we've continued to fundraise and it's about a 10 million now. And again, that's a thousand dollars for households that obviously can use that for medicine, for food, for education expenses. So very proud of that initiative. And again, it was one of the ways where we were able to use our own internal uh, mandate of equity and inclusion to make sure we were doing that in all the programs that we're putting forward. And I think that's just one example of, of, of just looking for opportunities to say, can we expand? Should we expand and how can we do it so that folks don't feel that hurt of saying, I see all these resources going to this group and my community has always been excluded. So what does that mean about me? There is like a value judgment that people feel and we just wanna make sure we address it. But understanding that there's a deep, deep history and there's a long way to gain trust, uh, but we do it little by little. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, one of the questions that just came up in the chat is uh, a question that comes up often, I think, when we talk about immigrant integration and communities and, and all of the terminology that's evolved over the years, you know, assimilation, transformation, integration, like where we're at today. And it's this balancing act of, you know, newcomers who come in and they want to feel like they belong and they you know, want to identify with the local communities, local communities that want to be welcoming and embrace uh, the cultures and the experiences of those coming from all around the world. How have you seen kind of this best practice coming together where that balance that, you know, that, that fulcrum comes and, um, and it starts to really work? Yes, I love this question. Uh, and I, I loved uh, the, uh, the question about what's the common point for both parties. And I think one of the reasons that compelled us uh, to, to use the term welcoming, and I think more recently to, to really embrace this idea of belonging is because that is the common point. We all want to feel at home in the communities that, that we live in. We all want to, to have a voice in those communities. Uh, we all want uh, in that moment of struggle to be able to access the kinds of programs in an equitable way, like the one that um, Nubia just talked about. And I think when we, uh, when we think about um, immigration uh, as sort of the inflection point that challenges us to think about how we create uh, that experience of belonging and of, of having agency in your community, um, when we think about that moment as an inflection point um, to look at it to look at it as a whole, um, it just allows us to think much more creatively about what needs to happen in a community to produce that sense of welcome for everyone. <laughs> so that the host communities are welcoming newcomers, so that newcomers are welcoming host communities into their homes. Uh, and I think um, some of the most uh, inspiring projects that we've seen recently, and, and particularly during Welcoming Week, which happened uh, in the middle part of September, uh, to, to really bring community together, um, focused on projects that enabled people to really work as co-equals, immigrants, non-immigrants coming together to you know, host a meal, uh, build a playground, uh, create uh, the kinds of things that that make communities great for everyone. So I, I know from just seeing who is on this list that many of you are already doing that <laughs> that kind of work. Um, but I think the that we're in a in a particular moment right now to to bring a lot of new energy um, and new allies and new partners into the work of what, you know, immigrant integration, immigrant inclusion, <laughs> however we want to call it, the work of welcoming. Um, to really be partners with us, uh, whether it's museums or libraries um, or other community-based organizations, um, places where people are already meeting as community uh, to create that sense of belonging really, really for everyone. There was a great article that appeared uh, this week in the Chicago Tribune about the 
relatively growing, largely growing Rohingya population here in Chicago. And this is a, a group that has uh, been persecuted in their country in Myanmar and uh, as refugees being resettled here and, and those who have been able to naturalize their citizenship are voting for the very first time in their lives uh, because they were not recognized as citizens in their country of origin. Uh, so in Chicago, seeing them, you know, participate in elections and being able to have a voice and a vote, uh, and in the interviews that were in that article of people who, you know, said that they finally feel like they belong somewhere, um, with really strong, you know, culture and backgrounds and language that comes with them, but really feeling like they finally found a home that, you know, you know welcomes their. Julian, if you let me uh, chip in something along that, uh, the, the immigrant integration in Chicago, probably nationally has sort of an un, unnoted hero, which is that uh, the refugee resettlement program was the seed of so much uh, community organization and, and creation of programs and, and coming in together across uh, groups. Um, we've always had a strong refugee resettlement program, which had a lot of different community-based organizations. And it's, 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 it was kind of the precursor to the kind of um, coalitions and things that we see today in, in a lot of places. Yeah. Rob, I know one question actually that we wanted to be able to cover is around the census. I mean, 2020 was a year of so many, so many challenges and immigration also became a wedge issue in our, our once in every 10 years US census that we count. Uh, I know you rely heavily on the census and Amer American community surveys uh, to do all of your analysis and um, demographic trends. So can you talk through some of the implications of what happened this year uh, when yeah. there were thinking about not counting uh, some of the immigrants in this country? Yeah, if you uh, if we were to look back at that map I had up early, or, uh, earlier today of the, the uh, city of Chicago and the suburbs, if you had a map like that of uh, census participation and such a thing is available, uh, the percent of households who have responded to their census uh, in immigrant areas and in African-American areas has been just incredibly low. Uh, even even um, as recently as a few weeks ago, you had census tracts where it was 30 or 40 percent had responded only. So the response rates are, are really uh, seriously low in a lot of uh, low-income communities, immigrant communities, African-American communities. And uh, this has always been a problem to count low-income communities, except that, you know, as you know, this, this year, over the last two years, about everything you could do to make it um, less palatable has been done. Um, you know, f uh, talking about undocumented being counted somehow, talking about undocumented and not being used for apportionment. In Chicago, uh, the administration talked about deploying ICE um, into the field, which it's never done uh, right during census week. So anyway, oh, and there's a lot more behind that. Uh, the, the, the census has been really, uh, uh, has been really, I almost want to say compromised pretty badly. Uh, and uh, when we get around to using the census for things like political redistricting, um, we'll, we'll see the effects of that is that we'll create political districts, for example, based on who was counted, but those districts will actually be much larger in terms of who lives there because people weren't counted. Um, so, um, uh, and the census, uh, you know, they, they've shut it off at this point. So basically, um, basically the damage has been done and we'll, we'll see We'll see uh, what kind of um, you know kind of magic they're going to cook up to make the numbers even show that we don't have declines from the last census. Nubia, do you want to chat a little bit about your experience trying to get the word out on census from the city? Yes, absolutely. So I was point person on uh, most of the outreach here with the census, and absolutely, it was difficult to first before COVID in and of itself, getting the message out that it was safe, that it was easy, that it was important. The citizenship question began right at the outset of really when that engagement was really beginning in a robust way. And that really created a chilling effect that it was very difficult to overcome. We saw large gaps, especially within the Spanish speaking community of people not filling it out. Um, and it was just really difficult to uh, make sure that the message was landing. We had we had really fantastic partners, FCB Chicago, which created some of our, our campaigns. Uh, we had a Civis um, Analytics, which was our data partner who helped us really go through all of that data. And so that was all helpful. In On the bright side, Chicago is actually ahead of most major cities, except New York, 
but other major cities, we, we landed ahead. But at the end of the day, as Rob mentions, and as the mayor reminds me, there were plenty of folks who were not counted and we literally could have used every single day. The fact that it, it wasn't extended is such a huge disappointment, especially as we hear murmurs that they probably won't make their December 31st deadline anyway. And so to know that, to know that these folks who are not, aren't counted in for a decade will have to deal with these consequences is just, it's a little bit more than I can uh, think about at the moment. But in terms of the actual work, again, because we did do better than most major cities, we can really talk about in, in, other, in another discussion in detail about all of the engagement we were able to do and how the community especially really came through and, and tried as hard as they could to make sure that their neighbors were counted. It was really a sight to see. That's great. Um, there's a question here in the chat, Nubia, actually uh, for you, also focused on the city and um, I'll just read it. It's how is the city ensuring that the welcoming rhetoric at the highest levels makes its way throughout all of the administrative bureaucracy? So how do you work with city employees and representatives uh, to embody the spirit and, and practice the mundane work every day um, and really, really be um, symbols, I think, of, of this welcoming mm -hmm. movement? No, that's a great question. I think ultimately one of the roles of the Office of New Americans is to help with that oversight because we have to remind other departments of what's happening, don't forget, and I've heard this. And so we have to be a voice that the community feels that they can trust and advocates know that they can come to us and that when they tell us, hey, we've heard this happen or this is a weird situation, that we don't shrug it off and say, oh, it was a one-time thing that we actually investigate and figure out what was happening to make sure that's resolved. But certainly I don't come with that kind of uh, <laughs> power and authority. It really starts from the top. If Mayor Lightfoot, frankly, wasn't as uh, aggressive of an advocate for the immigrant community and making sure we are a global welcoming city, that uh, ability for me to go and say, hey, I heard this happen, or can we check on this, would just not resonate as strongly as it would. But she really leads by example. I have literally protested in front of ICE with her. So we are at that level of engagement. And frankly, um, that is really what moves the needle. So that has been extremely helpful for my work um, and really is what gives me that push to be able to say, hey, this shouldn't have happened. Let's figure out why and let's, let's do better. So there's a question in this chat as well around driver's license. Um, the state of Illinois had passed a law back in 2013 uh, that allows any resident in the state to, to get a driver's license regardless of your status. I know that that's not the case in, in every state across the country, um, but that's been Chicago or the state of Illinois has already been at the forefront of that issue for a long time. Um, there was one last question. I know we're kind of wrapping up on our time, but there is another question that we really wanted to talk about with this group. And that's really about the infrastructure that we have in place right now to be welcoming and whether we think it's gonna be able to withstand and be resilient in the future. Is this, you know, just given all of the challenges that we've seen, uh, you know, from restrictive policies at the national level to pandemic, to economic recession, to racial justice. I mean, there's just been, this year has been very illuminating, I think for so many people. And as we think about the policies we have in place, like, is that enough, right? The question that we're all having is, is how are we gonna be able to build a stronger society? And I thought maybe we could go through, Rachel, we can start with you, but really what are you thinking about long-term that we need to be working towards? I was thinking, Juliana, as you were asking that question, somebody asked me yesterday if I was depressed. I was like, who has time to be depressed? We've got work to do. <laughs> And I, and I really feel that way. And I think that just is such a point of pride, uh, you know, with all of our members and, and with what's happening in Chicago. Um, and obviously, even two very different scenarios, uh, maybe multiple scenarios uh, at the end of this election cycle. I think, uh, you know, if we if we are in a situation where there's an administration that's favorable to to immigration, I think that there is a, a big opportunity to really um, continue supporting this kind of infrastructure in a lot of places and to really invest in it on, on the part of the federal government. Um, and I think, you know, if we continue to see the kind of uh, rhetoric and policy um, that we have uh, from, from the current administration, then I think that is really the moment where we where that infrastructure becomes even, even maybe even more important <laughs> to be pulling people off the sidelines um, and, and to really have the, the whole community invest, uh, invested in, in the idea that uh, you know, communities do have so much power 
uh, to you know not a, not only be defending people, but really uh, making sure that people who are here um, can be full participants in our democracy. Uh, and you know, and I know that they will, and I know that we will be here to support uh, to support our members in doing that work and, and to support one another. Rob, what do you think about the infrastructure that's in place? Is it going to be able to test test time or? Well, I think Are you there worried? is a story. There is something really good going on in Illinois to maintain the Illinois infrastructure, which is that um, the the growth of the of, of the of the Latino caucus in the state legislature, and the growth of other um, uh, non-white uh, groups entering the legislature. We have uh, we have Asian. We have a growing Asian and Latino presence in the state legislature, and that's not going to go backwards. That'll keep growing, and and they are almost all uniformly. I mean, they get it. Right, and then a similar thing in Chicago's uh, in the city of Chicago. We have 50. They're called aldermen. Um, uh, the number who are uh, you know from Latino communities is really growing. They're very vocal. Uh, they get it. So, I mean, they have these headwinds of economy and you know pandemic and all that, without a doubt. But there are some things we actually should be pretty happy about, or you know, good about. So I think that's important. And I did want to mention one thing as a sidebar, uh, Julianne, I wanted to thank you before we, we click off for you know, really having made this report possible in the Walder Foundation. I don't think I said that earlier. And my, and my colleague that you also um, engaged with is Paul uh, Nathaniel. I'm really glad for everything he did. I wanted to say, make sure I had a chance to say that. So there's some good news. There's Paul, there's you, there's Walder, and, the, and then there's the growing caucuses. There's lots of lots of strong actors out there, and thank you. And I know Paul's tuned in as well. He's on the on this call with us. Um, Nubia, what are you thinking? Are some of the the biggest recommendations for us to build back better? Yes. So as I mentioned before, I'm hopeful about the framework we were able to use for COVID, which was a rapid response framework, to expand that to use it more strategically for longer term projects. So I feel like that technically is what I, I'm hopeful about. But as we were speaking, I was reminded of when I used to practice immigration law and I had clients who had to submit statements about why they were here and all of those things. And there was like a little comment always at the end, almost all of those uh, with children had to explain why they, why they wanted to stay in the United States. And they almost always said, you know, I, I'm here because I want to show my children in Spanish, como seguir adelante, which means how to move forward. So when I think about everything we have facing us, we just have to continue to move forward. There is no going back, as Rob mentions, regardless of the uh, structures. We have to find ways to adapt and advance because uh, this is the winning ticket. Being a welcoming city is just better for everyone, regardless of the feelings that are attached and what that means. And so we just have to keep, um, keep progressing as much as possible. Yeah, that's a lot of optimism from our panel here. Um, I know that when I travel across the country and I, I engage with all kinds of residents from, from all corners, um, I, I do see this deepening political divide and immigration is just always such a divisive issue. It's, um, you know, despite the fact that it's a reality in our, in our world, not just in the United States, not just in Chicago, but it, it just um, really provokes and triggers so much uh, reaction from all different dimensions. It's trying to balance how do we keep Chicago and urban areas more broadly as these welcoming centers without deepening divides, which we're seeing a lot um, across the country is something that I think we all need to be thinking about as well. Um, we really only have a couple minutes left, so I do want to give everybody a chance to do kind of their, their closing um, comments, their closing words. What would you like to leave our viewers with, uh, given this conversation? And um, before we sign off, Rachel, do you want to start? Sure. Well, I think I shared some of my, <laughs> originally my parting thoughts, but um, one of the stories that I always carry around with me from Chicago from some of the early days of the office uh, was a story about how uh, the city government was trying to figure out how to make uh, bi small business development more inclusive of, uh, of growing uh, immigrant communities and realizing that they, you know, there was really very little interaction that was happening. <laughs> uh, and, and that process really led um, to some internal rethinking of how the permitting process was done. Um, which, you know, obviously en ended up making it a more streamlined process for immigrant communities, but really ended up making it a more streamlined process uh, for all small business owners. And I think that imperative 
uh, what we might call the curb cut effect that when we make things more inclusive um, for a segment of the population, it really benefits um, all of us who are trying to, to access the system um, really exists everywhere, but I think particularly in a, in a big city like Chicago. Um, and I know that a lot more has come since then in terms of supporting small businesses. Um, I know I saw Mario done this on the uh, chat here and saw that um, I know that Western Union has been supporting some of that work. So thanks to him. Um, but I think, you know, we uh, we all carry that self-interest in making sure that this that this goes well and that self-interest in, in being a welcoming community. And just again, want to thank you, uh, all of you for um, for this great webinar and all of you for joining us today. Thank you, Rachel. Ram, a closing thought for our viewers? Um, yeah, I mean, I, there's lots to be negative about, but I, I do feel positive about some things. Um, I, I don't see anti-immigrant sentiment taking root in Illinois in a big way. Uh, I just don't see it for lots and lots of historic reasons. And furthermore, I, I see, and, and Juliana, you've helped document this over the years, that uh, you see uh, smaller communities in, throughout the Midwest really waking up to the same exact things about needing to, to welcome and, and be open. So, um, you know, there, there, there is a lot of good work going on and a lot of good people, and that really is true. And so I, 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 think, um, I think we will prevail. And Nubia? Yes, um, as, we, as we talk about the divide, I think one of the things that has helped us as a city and perhaps can help other jurisdictions who are looking to kind of overcome that pushback is that we have just taken the stance that this is the morally right thing to do. You can kind of get with the program or not. We hardly ever talk about the economic net positive of immigrants, which is obviously so strong. We really have taken the stance that this is the morally right thing to do and we're gonna do right by the communities. And it has been a winning uh, argument so far and we hope to continue to advance that because it is again, just by the statistics, by the data, by the stories, by the history, it is just the smart pragmatic approach. Um, and I, I hope that in the future, we have more ways to engage with that divide by sharing information with folks who are hesitant. But again, um, it has really been our moral compass and it has been a, a good one to take. Mm -hmm. And again, thank you, uh, of course, to Juliana and to Rob for this amazing report. We've used it already so much and to the audience as well for being so engaging and interested in making sure that we can advance our immigrant communities. Thank you. The, uh, the report concludes at the end, I, something I really took to heart. Um, the task at hand is to take this legacy and to raise it to even higher levels. So that's something that I think uh, hopefully we can all be a part of. I encourage everyone to continue building their uh, inclusive communities that we wanna see. And thank you all for your commitment. Please join me in thanking our speakers, Rachel, Rob, and Nubia, and our hosts, Welcome America and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for convening this. Um, thank you all as well for tuning in. I'm going to turn it back to Anthony, who's going to close us up for today. Thanks so much, Juliana. And yes, I want to extend a thank you to you and Rachel, Rob, and Nubia again. Thank you all so much for a great conversation. Um, I'm going to share my screen again really quickly uh, because I do want to make sure everyone is aware that um, we've put in uh, the chat uh, the link to the report a few times there. Uh, but you should have that showing up again. Uh, so you can go ahead and download that if you've not already done so. We'll also include it as part of the follow-up uh, email that we will be sending out. Um, the webinar has been recorded, so we'll send you not only the link to the recording, but again, the URL so you can download the report there. So look for that probably by end of day tomorrow. So again, thank you all to all of our speakers and Juliana for moderating. Uh, and thank you to all of you for attending and sharing some of your day with us. We really appreciate it and uh, look forward to seeing you on an upcoming webinar very soon. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your afternoon.